Well, let's jump in because now everyone's been waiting on how they can dial back their age and how they can try to become younger. Um, and let's talk about some of these things. I, I, a quote from you is quite simply, you said after 25 years of researching aging and having read thousands of scientific papers, if there's one piece of advice I can offer, one surefire way to stay healthy longer, one thing you can do to maximize your lifespan right now, it's this, eat less. Speak on this, David, because nobody wants to hear this. And every message we get all day long is the opposite of that message. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a disaster. I mean, the modern world, as we call it, uh, is, is all about eating. And nutritionists have really done, many of them have done a really poor job in making us live longer. Uh, the old idea, and even the current idea for many nutritionists is, don't be hungry, eat lots of little meals, make sure that you're, you're always fed. Um, and so we live in a world now where breakfast is, quote unquote, the most important meal of the day. Turns out that's an advertising campaign that's not based on science. You want to have a snack mid-morning, don't be hungry. Have a lunch, snack in the afternoon, have your protein bar, then have a dinner. Uh, then you might even snack late at night. This is the recipe for having a short lifespan. You might feel good, but the problem is what you're doing is you're never letting your body go into adversity mode. And the genes that protect us against aging and um, diseases of aging are suppressed by our lifestyle. So when I say eat less, I should have really said eat less often because I eat the normal amounts of food that I should for someone my age. Um, I maintain my weight. I'm not getting thinner. We don't want malnutrition. We don't want starvation for sure, especially in our kids. Uh, but what I want to do is to have an eating window of time that's, that's not spread out through the day. And so what I try to do is I try to skip breakfast, have a very small amount for breakfast. I have a little bit of yogurt. And then I try to go as long as I can drinking a lot of hot tea. I have right here next to me uh, a lot of beverages. I drink a uh, thick green tea matcha. I finished that one. I drink beverages that don't have a lot of calories, have no sugar in them, but will give me the nutrients that I need during the day. I don't get hungry. And then I eat a really enjoyable large dinner to pack in my calories into about two to three hours. That's my eating window. Now, if I get hungry, I'll eat a little bit of sugar-free chocolate or some nuts. I'm not so strict about it. If I'm hungry, I will eat a little bit. But I, again, I try to pack it in. But don't try to do that tomorrow. If, if you're a three meals and snacks kind of person, start with trying to skip one meal or eat a smaller amount and get your body used to it. It turns out your body can make its own sugar. Your liver does what's called gluconeogenesis. It makes its own sugar. You can measure it. If you want to get a glucose monitor and slap it on your arm, by all means do that. And you'll see that over two weeks of doing what I'm telling you, your liver will get used to it and start making its own sugar. So instead of having these super high spikes of blood sugar and then deficits, and then you get the brain fog and the hunger, and then you eat again, and it's this cycle of too much sugar and not enough sugar in your body, that's the modern, that's the current existence of most people. It's horrible. I go through the day not feeling hungry, not having any brain fog. I have lots of focus, lots of brain energy, lots of physical energy through the day. And that's a much better way to live. And the good news is that if you do what I'm telling you, science says that your body will fight aging far more than if your body's always just in this abundance mode. This is such an important point to make. And the reason we eat so often is because of marketing, You're right? It's this entire marketing campaign that we grew up in. You're in the States right now. It's even worse there. You know, eating is worse there. Portions are massive. Food is everywhere. Um, I, you know, I grew up in California and in America, in a weird way, a food, you almost measure the man by the size of his food. There's a really weird relationship with food in that country. And I think we're starting to see it in a damaging way in obesity levels. But, um, you know, I had a guest on my show who had just come off of a very long fast. I think he had just come off like a 20 day fast and he came to talk to me about it. His name is Timothy Sheaf. And I basically decided to do, uh, a 48 hour kind of water fast on the back of it. First time ever. And I did it. And David, one of the things I realized was when I went to grab or a piece of food or a drink or something, I soon realized that that urge had nothing to do with calorie deficit, had nothing to do with nutrition. It was a habit 
I had picked up just like a dopamine habit to pull out my phone when I was bored or to do something like that. And I realized once I got over that, I felt fine, I felt great, everything was okay. I just had to resist this urge that I had. It just made me feel better is all it really was. And and again, I went the whole day and a half, whatever, you, you go to sleep one night, you don't eat all day, you go to sleep the next night. And I learned a ton about myself of just my own psychology of my triggers to eat. And I wouldn't say I was on the bad end of the spectrum either. Um, I don't know, does this sound familiar? <laughs> Some of these reactions? Yeah, it really does. And, and I'm not a David Goggins, I'm a David Sinclair. And David Sinclair is pretty lazy, he likes food. Um, so if, if I can do this, anyone can, seriously. So what I do is, first of all, I ask myself, am I really hungry? Or am I just bored or stressed? Yeah, That's the first question. And usually, like you say, it's, I'm just bored or stressed. I'm not really hungry. But if I am hungry, what I then do, or even if I'm stressed, I'll reach for something liquid rather than solid. So here, I always have some water around or something hot. I'll make a tea. I definitely give my kidneys a, a run for their money. Put a bit of lemon in there, a bit of monk fruit sugar or stevia in, if I like sweetness. Think about beverages, focus on beverages, not sugar beverages, but anything but. But uh, that that's what gets me through the day. It's, you know, we're mammals, we like to put stuff in our mouths. Uh, it's just a habit of ours, um, but it's fine. I think that you need to substitute something. I, I wouldn't say try to, to never put something in your mouth, just substitute, you know, put something that, that you can chew on. It might be, you know, I'm not a big fan of chewing gum, but if that helps, if it's sugar-free gum, or something else, a little bit of sugar-free chocolate, as I mentioned, those things will get you through those moments of uh, weakness. The greedy bankers are about to do it again. In 2008, they crashed our financial system and nearly bankrupted the entire global economy. Then they received trillions of dollars in government bailouts. And after, they demanded fat bonuses paid for by you, the taxpayer. It turns out the banks haven't just been screwing the American taxpayers, they're also screwing over their investors. Turns out uh, the banking industry is the worst place you could put your money, despite enormous taxpayer bailouts. Now the bankers are back to take away your financial freedom. They lie and tell you that cryptocurrency isn't safe. They try to make it illegal for you to choose how to invest your hard-earned money. They lie and say cryptocurrency is used by money launderers and criminals. But look at the record. It's the banks themselves that launder hundreds of billions of dollars every year to the biggest criminal operations in the world. Leaked documents have revealed how some UK banks have helped criminals, money launderers and Russians under sanctions. American authorities discovered that the Sinaloa cartel moved $881 million through HSBC accounts as bank officials turned a blind eye to the illegality. The bankers lie and say cryptocurrency is not a real investment. Meanwhile, the smartest CEOs in the world are buying billions and billions of it. The truth is that banks lie about cryptocurrency because it makes them scared. The banks take $9 trillion per year of your hard-earned money, and they are worried that they will finally be exposed. They're scared because crypto means they can no longer control your money, which means they can no longer control you. They are scared because you might actually understand your money and intelligently decide what to do with it. Now is the time for us to come together, fight back and take control. It's time to educate ourselves, our families and our communities because financial education means financial freedom. We know that cryptocurrencies will help us build the new decentralized financial system of the future a banking system that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. A banking system where access to finance is a fundamental human right. A banking system that is free and fair and welcomes all humans on this earth. 
the DeFi revolution is happening. We, the people, can no longer be fooled. We choose to take control of our finances. We choose to take control of our freedom. We choose to take control of our future. Join us and let's take back our financial freedom forever.